my name is Ladislav and I will be talking about our project on elasticine spur deformers for character articulation. Let's take a cylinder and bend it with dual quaternion skinning. This is what we get. This is actually the correct solution. This is not a bug. About four years ago, a rigging artist contacted me and asked if I could somehow fix this bulging artifact. And it turned out to be not so simple. I mean, it is relatively simple to get a nice bend. All we need to do is establish a volumetric discretization, here a voxel grid, for example, and find a quasi-static solution of a nonlinear elastic energy, for example, the corrotated model. If we do this, we obtain a beautiful band. Unfortunately, this is orders of magnitude slower than dual quaternion skinning. This is because standard skinning employs just a fairly simple closed form expressions where we directly compute the target position of each vertex. On the other hand, with corrugated volumetric elasticity, we need to solve a nonlinear optimization problem by employing some iterative method, so that it's much more expensive. So the natural question is if we can combine the advantages of the two approaches and the answer is positive. This is what this talk is about and I will discuss how we developed a simple closed form deformer which achieves similar quality as nonlinear volumetric elasticity while remaining almost as fast as standard skinning. So let's start with some background. Skinning doesn't work just with cylinders. We can take an arbitrary 3D model as long as it's equipped with an animation skeleton. So the skeleton are really just connected rigid bodies representing bones. And the task is to deform this model for an arbitrary skeleton posture. To be able to do this, we need two things. We need skinning transformations and skinning weights. So first, the skinning transformations, they are just rigid body transformations which describe where each bone moved from the rest pose. So for example, the lower arm bone moved like this and the upper arm bone would be another rigid body transformation. The skinning weights describe how the bone transformations are actually applied to deform the model. So they are again associated with bones and here we are looking at a weight of the lower arm bone. Here is another example of the upper arm weight. So the red part, that's where the weight is close to one, it would be almost rigidly transformed along with the bone. And the light red region is where the blending takes place. So if you look at these two weights, it's sort of obvious that the blending is happening near the joints or most blending is happening near, near the joints. If you look at um, more weights, for example, this is the clavicle weight and uh, upper arm, uh, sorry, uh, the upper spine weight. These weights are traditionally painted by artists, but more recently there were some uh, automatic techniques proposed. What we are looking at here are the bounded biharmonic weights. Another question is how do we actually blend the bone transformations? So the simple solution is just linear. That, that leads to the well-known linear blend skinning, which has these also well-known candy wrapper artifacts while twisting. Uh, we know that we can fix this artifact by switching to dual quaternion blending. Dual quaternions uh, have this bulging issue I mentioned before, but on twist they produce what, would, what we would expect. They preserve the distance from the center of the cylinder. Of course, there was uh, quite a bit of research on advanced skinning methods, which I broadly categorize into these groups. Both the data-driven and the geometric methods, they are very fast. But uh, sometimes they require a fair amount of work, fair amount of user input if you want to get some nice uh, effects. On the other hand, physics-based methods, they give us many nice effects uh, almost for free without too much manual labor. For example, contact, collisions, dynamics. What we have to pay with is the compute time. One possibility to speed this up is to simulate only in a low dimensional subspace. That's an approach called reduced order physics. So this is much faster than full physics, but it's still more expensive than simple closed form skinning. So it falls about here on the spectrum of speed. What we are aiming for is basically to replicate the speed of closed form deformers, but without compromising much of the quality of nonlinear elasticity. So we are aiming for a method that's very fast, but as good as possible. So some more background, um, volumetric elasticity. So here we are using just a very simple model. We start by establishing a volumetric discretization. We could use um, multiple choices, but we just chose the simple regular voxel grid. 
And the idea is that some of the voxels represent bones. Those are the voxels inside, and they will be moved rigidly by the bone transformation. So their position will be given. The remaining voxels, they represent uh, some homogeneous elastic material. And what they will do? Well, they will minimize an elastic deformation energy. So let me explain what an elastic deformation energy model we use. We use the, the previously proposed simple geometric elastic model. So let's look at one deformed voxel. And this deformed voxel started somewhere in the rest pose. This is how it looked like in the rest pose. And what we can do is find the best fit rotation, which optimally aligns the two. And once we have done that, we can look at the edges and compute the difference. And what we do is take the squared norm of the difference between these two edges and sum it for all pairs. And then we also sum it over all voxels. So once we do this and after some algebraic manipulation, we get this final formula. So in this formula, V are the vertex positions, the degrees of freedom, the, the, the deformed vertices. The L and K, those are some constant matrices. They can be pre-computed. They depend just on the rest post voxel grid. And R are uh, the auxiliary variables, so they are the best fit rotations. Now to compute the deformation, we need to minimize this energy subject to some linear equality constraints. The, the constraints that express that the voxels corresponding to the bones are fixed. So this is a nonlinear optimization problem, which can be solved with a variety of methods. We use the local global approach, which is an instance of block coordinate descent. It's a fairly good method, but unfortunately it is much slower than skinning, but also much nicer. If you look at the results, uh, it, 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 it does what we would intuitively expect. So what we want to do is somehow get a similar behavior, we get a similar result, but uh, much faster. So enough of background, let's start with our method. Let's assume for a moment we are only allowed to use linear blend skinning at runtime. This is actually not such an unrealistic assumption that can happen uh, quite easily if we are working, for example, in games or other real-time applications. But even if we are stuck with linear blend skinning, we can still choose the skinning weights. And we can choose them in a smart way. We can choose them so that the resulting deformations minimize this elastic deformation energy I was just talking about. So to measure the deformation energy, we should be integrating over all possible rotations, but turns out we can just work with some sample rotations to simplify things. Actually, it turns out it doesn't even matter so much as I will describe later. So linear blend skinning is a linear model. So it means that the relationship between weights and the final uh, deformed vertices is linear. So here the MI is the matrix corresponding to the rotation sample number I for the cylinder example I'm showing here, we just use two rotation samples, zero and 90 degrees rotation. So uh, it's very simple. The W are the skinning weight, that's what we will be solving for, and the VI are the resulting deformed vertex position, the, the result of linear blend skinning. So uh, we can put this uh, for, or formalize it as a, this uh, optimization problem. So here E is the elastic deformation energy I, I talked about before. And we want to minimize this when we sum over uh, all sample rotations. So this is an optimization, a nonlinear optimization problem, but we can solve it and we get the following weights. So the, the optimal weights for linear blend skinning result in these deformations. So we can notice the twist got a little more spread out when compared to bounded bar harmonic weights. That's quite obvious when we show the difference side by side. So here I'm flipping between the bounded bar harmonic weights with linear blend skinning and the elastic energy minimizing weights also with linear blend skinning. So we can see it got a little better because it minimizes the correlated elastic energy, but the candy vapor is still present. The candy vapor artifact is still there. That's not surprising because we know that no choice of weights can possibly remove this artifact. That's because this is caused by the blend, linear blending of transformations. So we can remove the candy wrapper by switching to dual quaternions. So let's try this. In dual quaternions, the effect of weights is no longer linear. So instead of a matrix, now we have a nonlinear function psi. So instead of a, a linear problem, we have a little more complicated. It is actually still a nonlinear problem. Now it's just a little more nonlinear, if you will. The optimization problem becomes a little more difficult, but it's still not so bad because the C and its derivatives are fairly easy to calculate, just dual quaternion skinning. 
So once we solve this optimization problem we, and use the quaternion skinning, we get the following result. So as expected, the candy vapor artifact is no longer here, as you can see, but there is still a bit of that bulging artifact, even though it now looks much better than with bounded by harmonic weights. So this is bounded by harmonic weights with dual quaternions, and those are dual quaternions with the, the elastic energy minimizing weights. So we can see that the weights uh, computed by minimizing the corrotated elastic energy look a little bit better, in my opinion, but the bulge again is still there. That's uh, quite obvious when we compare it to the direct energy minimization solution. So this is the solution. This is the result of dual quaternions with the optimal weights, and this is what we get with direct energy minimization. So you can clearly see that the bulge did not happen if we did not have the restriction that we need to use a dual quaternion skinning. So. I argue there is actually a fundamental problem behind both linear and dual quaternion skinning. And that, that's in, the, in, in that, that both linear and dual quaternion skinning, they treat all directions as equal. But they are not quite equal, right? There is this rigid bones that are inside. So the material should resist the deformations much more in the direction along the rigid bone as opposed to in the orthogonal directions. That's where the squish and stretch is happening, as, as we can see here. So I argue we need a different model. We need a model to capture this anisotropy. And this is what I'll explain next. Our uh, concept or our way to capture this anisotropy uh, is using joint-based deformers. So let me explain this on the example of an elbow. We can define a coordinate system centered at this joint at the elbow. And by convention, we can pick the z-axis to point along the direction of the bone. This is really just a convention to simplify things. And then we can reason about deformations of the space in the vicinity of this joint. So deformations of the space are really just mappings from R3 to R3. <clears throat> But because the elbow can rotate, for each rotation we will have a different spatial deformation. So we actually have this whole family of deformations and we can call this gamma. So the gamma is an example, is a joint-based deformer. And what does it do? Well, it takes a rotation Q and an input point X and it tells us where the point is mapped. That's a completely general concept. So here gamma could be pretty much anything as long as it describes the deformations in the vicinity of the joint. That, that, that's, the, that's the only idea there. How to extend this concept to the whole body? Well, if we have a deformer explaining deformations near the elbow, we need to say that these deformations only apply in the vicinity of the elbow. So we define its area of influence, which says where this deformer actually applies. So this is similar to a skinning weight, except that now it's centered at a point, not at a bone. That's actually important. If we have another deformer, uh, for example, in the shoulder, and we can again define its influence weight. And then what we do, we simply apply all these deformers and then blend the results together using these deformer weights. So that's a very similar idea as with standard skinning, except that now these blending weights have a different function. Because remember, in standard skinning, which I talked about in the beginning, we have these weights that are like bone-centric. So most of the blending is happening near the joints, right? This is what, what was with the standard skinning. Uh, with joint-based deformers we are proposing here, we will actually rely on the joint-based deformers themselves to capture the deformations near the joints. And the blending, as you can see here, that will be happening like somewhere halfway through the upper arm bone. And there is typically not so much to blend because most of the deformations in a human body is happening near the joints. So this blending will be, the blending uh, described by the weights is much less critical in this case. So here we are using just a simple point based bounded by harmonic weights because th th that was completely sufficient. So, so far I described the theoretical framework. So this idea is best to convey in a piece of code actually. So the joint-based deformer is like an abstract class. So we cannot run it or look at the results. What we need is some specific implementation. And that's what I will discuss next. We need a swing, uh, what we come up with is a swing twist deformer. So the motivation here is, and there is an interesting question we can ask. What would be the simplest and fastest deformer that gets rid of, of all the artifacts of linear and dual quaternion skinning we have observed? So what is the simplest way to fix this? 
and the answer we propose is called the swing twist deformer. The idea is actually fairly simple. We liked how linear blending handles bending, we, we like the squish and stretch there, but for twisting we prefer dual quaternions. So we can basically combine them in a smart way. So now we design a specific joint based deformer, the swing twist deformer. So what it does as a, any joint based deformer, it takes rotation and a point and the rotation can be now decomposed into a twist and swing component. So remember by convention I chose the, the coordinate system such that the z-axis points in the direction of the bone. So we only need to worry about the twist about the z-axis. So the twist is really just rotation about the z-axis, nothing fancy. And the swing is a change of direction of the z-axis, which is actually equivalent to uh, saying that we have a rotation with a rotation axis in the x-y plane. And once we have performed this swing twist decomposition, which is by the way very simple to do, especially if you represent the rotations using quaternions, that it's a fairly simple matter of applying a spherical interpolation to the twist, followed by linear interpolation of the swing. So here note the functions t and s, here the, the t is the twist weight and s is the swing weight. How do these look like? Well the swing weight looks like this, for example for the shoulder. Know that uh, the job of this deformer is to just describe the deformations near the shoulder, so the weight can as well be 1 uh, at the end of the arm, doesn't, doesn't really matter. And this is an example of a twist weight. So how did we compute these weights? Well, that's what I was, I was talking about in the beginning. Those are the elastic energy minimizing weights for uh, samples that correspond to twisting rotations and bending rotations. We were actually fairly sloppy about the, the, the sampling. Here we just used four samples and here just two samples. And that's because we found basically it doesn't matter a whole lot. In theory we should really be integrating over all rotations, but I found that just increasing the number of samples leads to pretty diminishing returns. So I argue the algorithm is not very sensitive to sampling. So just to summarize the final algorithm, we start by establishing a voxel grid and then we pre-compute the weights. So first the swing and twist weights, as I just explained, and the deformer blending weights. So those are just point-wise bounded by harmonic weights centered at joints. And what we do at runtime, we evaluate all the joint-based deformers. In our case it's the swing twist deformer. And then blend the results together using these deformer blending weights that are pre-computed. Now what is worth pointing out is that there is no manual intervention needed other than picking the resolution of the voxel grid. So let's look at some results. So here we compare our final result, the swing twist deformer with elastic energy minimizing weights against direct elastic energy minimization. So the direct elastic energy minimization is orders of magnitude slower than our result, but visually it's well, not exactly the same, but I would argue it gets close. So in the rest of the comparisons we will be comparing our technique against linear blend skinning and dual quaternion skinning with bounded by harmonic weights because I would argue that's the state of the art right now if we don't assume any extra input. So we can see here that our proposed swing twist deformer avoids both, both the bulging artifacts of dual quaternions as well as the candy wrapper artifacts of linear blend skinning. Let's look at a more interesting example. So here is a more realistic model. Then so the animation here is a simultaneous bending and twisting of the elbow. So in this example we can actually see artifact with both linear and dual quaternion skinning in one frame right here. So this is the close-up of the motion. And our deformer produces much more realistic deformations. We can look at the artifacts individually, starting with the well-known candy wrapper artifacts. So dual quaternions here work just fine, that's what they do, they fix the candy wrapper artifact. Unfortunately dual quaternions have the problem with the bulging artifact, which actually turns out to work fine with linear blending. And because our deformer combines the strengths of the two, we get nice good looking solution in both cases. There is another type of artifact which I attribute to the bounded by harmonic weights, the automatic weights. 
um, and that's because the weight distribution uh, can be a li little bit too large in this case. That's because the bounded biharmonic weights they don't really minimize the corrotated elastic deformation energy. So sometimes the weights are a little larger than we would probably want. So for example, here they deform also a piece of the armadillo's shell, whereas it should probably stay rigid. It's a large chunk of region, so that should not be deformed if we are minimizing some energy. Uh, of course, the artifacts are not completely orthogonal. What's happening here is that the bulging artifacts of dual quaternions is ex ex actually, ex excuse me, is actually exacerbated by the too far spread of bounded biharmonic weights. Another uh, funny case is here. Notice how the heel deforms when I bend the ankle with linear bending and dual quaternion skinning. So why, why is this deformation? Well, it's because the bounded biharmonic weights, they diffuse uniformly. So they make, they make the heel quite elastic. That's because it's about 50-50 uh, influence in the heel region. That means that it gets all, all, the, all the deformation. On the other hand, optimal bend weight concentrates the bending at the ankle, where it is more natural. So this is more like a real foot. So we can also look at full body animation, for example, this ballet sequence. Uh, the skinning artifacts here are less visible, but are still noticeable. If we switch back and forth, uh, here is linear blend skinning and dual quaternion skinning and our method. So there are all these artifacts I was talking about before in isolation. So an important question is that of runtime performance. When compared to linear blend skinning, the main overhead consists in evaluating the deformers. In our case, it is the swing twist deformer. So what, what it does, what it has to compute is a 2D slurp, 2D spherical linear interpolation for the twist, followed by linear blending for the swing. So what this takes is 31 floating point operations and two extra weights. So all in all, this is a small constant overhead when compared to linear blend skinning. The main point, however, is that this is still a very simple closed form expression. The pre-processing is a little uh, more time consuming. Uh, in our cases, it took from six to 20 minutes, depending on, on the model. The bottleneck actually is computing the point based bounded by harmonic weights. And this is for resolutions from about 20 to 40,000 uh, voxel vertices. So there are some limitations and opportunities for future work. So first is that the elastic energy tends to prevent self collisions, but does not guarantee anything. Self penetrations can sometimes do occur. So another thing is that we only tested one possible joint based deformer. It would be very nice to explore the entire space. There are some trivial choices. We can just use pure linear or pure spherical skinning for some joints. Another more interesting example we could investigate is a nonlinear blend between linear and spherical blending based on how far did we go in the band, so based on the band angle. And really there are no limitations to what we could possibly do in joint-based deformers, or there is very little limitations. Uh, another thing is that we use only very crude model for our elastic deformation energy. At the very least, we could better model the geometry of the bones and the muscles that could, I think, already improve their, their quality quite a bit. And we could go as far as doing a full uh, biomechanically accurate simulation of the human body. So uh, to conclude, our method combines the speed of skinning with the quality of nonlinear elasticity. And this was made possible thanks to first the elastic energy minimizing weights and second the joint based deformers. So this concludes my talk and please feel free to contact me by email and I will be happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you.